Hi guys, it's finally here. Dark Souls 2 bosses ranked by law. Before I get into it, just a quick thing from me. Everything said here is my opinion. The sheer number of bosses in Dark Souls 2 is immense and developing the lore for each entry to make a point was one of the hardest things I've had to do. So there may be some discrepancies you don't agree with and that is fine. It's this sort of thing that makes this community thrive. Without further ado, here's the first entry. The first on our list is the Royal Rat Vanguard. As simple in gameplay as it is in the lore, the Royal Rat Vanguard is not too dissimilar to his more average overgrown rat kin. Distinguished likely in two means, the Vanguard is for one able to bring to life petrified statues of other rats, and may even possess the ability to do the same for other petrified beings, but this is never really elaborated on. Alongside its ability to bring to life petrified rats, it seems to also have the authority to command their actions. With an influence over the rats of the underworld, the vanguard acts as a confidant for the royal rat authority in assessing who is deemed worthy for an audience with the king. However, it is clear that the royal rat vanguard was less of a combatant and bear most of the hallmarks of a regular rat, something you yourself could probably take on in a fight. Throughout both lists thus far, it's rare that a boss's gameplay matches their lore strength. From the shock I read from a lot of you guys regarding Pinwheel's placement in the last game, to the frustration some of you guys felt seeing Gwyn being placed 8th, the truth is, for the most part, the gameplay is rarely fully indicative of the true strength a boss should command if you go by lore alone. Thankfully, the next entry is perfectly in line with both gameplay and law. The covetous demon is a being of unknown origin that would fall in love with Mitha, the baneful queen. Mitha, however, was preoccupied entirely by her love for a separate man and likely the royalty of a neighbouring domain. Mitha's story is for later in the video though. The covetous demon would mourn his inability to win over the queen and would lay in close proximity to her, longing for a chance to share his affection. Unfortunately, no such chance would arise and he would, just like any good protagonist from a rom-com, drown his sorrows in copious amounts of ice cream, except the ice cream in this case was actually just whatever food he could find. It's indicated in his soul description that eating is an expression of desire. There was once a man whose deep affection was unrequited. He transformed into the covetous demon, which only made him lonelier than before. In assessing the strength of the covetous demon, there are two avenues we can explore. The first is his title. Proclaimed a demon by much of the titling in this game, there is actually very little evidence to indicate he is a demon in the Dark Souls sense of the term. With no affiliation with the monumental strength of the Bed of Chaos, it's likely he is only a demon in a colloquial sense, grotesque in design and seemingly mutated. It's not surprising to see how the residents of Drang Lake would see him this way. Of course, the second way we can measure his strength, or maybe more relatively his weakness, is in his item descriptions. The Bone Scythe tells us the curved spine of the covetous demon is as hard as rock, and rather than slicing through flesh, the weapon seems to grind it apart. If we equate some of the themes of his boss battle and the item descriptions, it seems the covetous demon was less of a predator, more so something more akin to a scavenger, as his prowess lies not within how he can kill his foes, and more so in how he was able to eat them efficiently. He may even have just been a waste disposal unit for the Earthen Peak's various victims, or even a bottom feeder that would consume the corpses of less fortunate beings. Regardless, he is, by all methods, tricks a foe of very little danger to any prepared undead seeking his demise, ranking just above the Royal Rat Vanguards due to his size. Following the trend of easy gameplay bosses sharing similar credit in the lore, we have the Prowling Magus and Congregation. Seldora was once a place of prosper, named after the man who would find the originally abandoned mining colony. Seldora saw potential in the region and began a campaign to restart its economy. Soon, Seldora would find a secret laying beneath 
the land, a cave filled with crystals. By investing a large amount of resources cultivating these crystals, Seldora was able to transform the old colony into a prosperous business and built a town around the crystal caves named after himself. As greedy as Seldora was ambitious, he dug and dug and eventually found a very small spider that caught his allure. A tiny being that likely hearkened his ambition and greed, he cherished the spider, housed it and eventually gave away everything to its own hunger for influence. But that's a story for a later entry. What we do know here is that Freya, the spider who would overrun Seldora, unleashed a tyrant of minions and took complete control over the town. Vendrick acknowledging the rising threat of the Duke's dear Freya would eventually dispatch some of his own subjects to aid the town in their fight against the spider. Building a camp around the town, they were barely powerful enough to push any further than their own camps. With victims pouring out en masse, Vendrick accompanied his royal army with priests and mages. As refugees piled into the camps, the priests took the role of tending to the wounded, and eventually, a magus likely from Aldia's domain would come to the refugees. It's unclear as to what the Magus intended to do here. Was it to look over the denizens, to research, or maybe to take advantage of their weakened state for his own gain? We will never know, but what we do know is when we arrive in the land, many of the royals, warriors, refugees, priests, and even the Magus have gone hollow. Consumed by the abyss, the Magus hosts a congregation of these refugees and priests in a church. And it is here that we face off against this hostile group. The Magus himself is likely not to be too notable in strength. Likely talented in sorcery and in this hollow state can actually take advantage of dark magics, just like the mages of Ulisil. Alongside him, however, are two priests, equipped with priest chimes that indicate they were high-ranking clerics and may have originally joined the party to heal the refugees. But by the time that we meet them, they are utilising lightning spears to fend us off. And for the congregation, well, they are all but withered into crawling corpses with little in the way to fend for themselves. The battle is less of a battle against a hardened group of combatants and more so an interruption of a congregation clinging to each other as they lose grip of their souls and thus their memory as to why they were there in the first place. Likely the first shock of this list, the next entry on the list is Vendrick. Much like Gwyn's story from Dark Souls 1, Vendrick's story is not just one of a boss who adds some layer of context to the world. Vendrick's story is the context of Drang Lake. Details of his story are the narrative foundations of the entire world. Not unlike our own protagonist, Vendrick found himself in the lands between, in the very spot we later call Drang Lake. Likely the world burdened by the existence of four Lord Souls, Vendrick's first act in this new land was to defeat the four bearers of the Lord Souls, capture their souls, and utilise the immensity of his newfound strength and influence to build Drang Lake, a region under a new bureaucracy, one of his own. One that put the strength of simple men at the forefront of all decisions. Eventually a woman named Nashandra of unknown origin would find herself in Drang Lake and develop a loving relationship with the now established monarch. Vendrick too would fall in love with this woman and in time Nashandra, now queen of the realm, would advise her now loyal husband to attack the distant land of the giants, forewarning of their existential threat. Launching a full-scale invasion, Vendrick alongside his wife would lead a devastating campaign against the giants and would would win, taking home a prize. Though unnamed, the prize in question is likely the giant's kinship, an artifact or knowledge he would bring home. Using this pillaged knowledge, he would join arms with his brother, Aldia. Aldia would devise golems that possess the ability to come alive. Ever grateful to Nishandra for her foresight, he would then use this invention to build Drang Lake Castle, a home for his wife situated right above the kiln of the first flame, a place Vendrick already held a deep affinity for. 
It's after this that Nashandra's influence would begin overshadowing Vendrick's own, and Dranglake would succumb to a peace, unlike any other. A peace Chancellor Welliger describes as the Dark. Some of Vendrick's allies would begin to worry about this development and air their grievances. Vendrick disregarded them, and these events would even lead to the banishment of one of Vendrick's most closest confidants, Rain. Soon after Rame's exile, Dranglake would face some level of karmic justice, as the giants are back to retaliate and are led by their very own reflection of Vendrick, the giant king. The giant's invasion would cause devastation to Dranglake, leaving much of the region in rubble, never to be recovered. However, the giant king would be brought down and Vendrick would eventually return to his castle. Unfortunately, this return is lowly met, as soon the undead curse would begin to afflict many of his subjects. Fearful of this, Vendrick would commission his brother, Aldir, to research into souls and a means of suppressing the curse. Both would learn a great deal about the nature of humanity, the dark, and the undead curse. But despite various attempts and failed experiments, nothing fruitful would ever come. In this time, Nishandra would begin urging the king to seek the throne of want and bring about a new age entirely, one that likely, in Nishandra's sake, allowed for an age of entire darkness. Finally seeing through Nishandra's deceit, understanding that Nishandra was a being of the dark and fearful that he was susceptible to her influence, he would flee to the shrine of Amana, abandon his soul away behind layers of illusion and protections, and finally find a resting place deep within the crypts. And by the time that we meet Vendrick, he's still in the crypts, completely hollowed and soulless. Even his magnificent soul that harboured the four great ones was left elsewhere. He is a complete soulless husk at this point. Regardless of his entire history, he is as shallow as the very hollows that roam his kingdom. Vendrick, undergrown his own attire, walks aimlessly left limp and lacklustre. Our fight with this formerly chosen one is likely to be anything but physically difficult, but the mental anguish of facing Vendrick may be the real challenge here. This is why Vendrick is ranked so low, as in truth, Prime Vendrick would likely rank right at the top of this very list. If Vendrick was the thesis of the world of Dark Souls 2, The Last Giant was his antithesis. In this, The Last Giant was in many ways Vendrick's contemporary, or better yet, arch-rival, as once the giants unprepared for a full invasion by Dranglake were left pillaged and barren, they sought revenge. Led by the King of Giants and likely Vendrick's parallel, the giants crossed the seas and waged war on Dranglake, laying rubble to the Cardinal Towers. Eventually, however, the forces of Vendrick would gain the advantage and bring an end to the conflict, albeit facing incredible losses. A major turning point of the war was when an unnamed hero would best the giant lord and bring him down, casting him in chains and leaving him to suffer within the rubbles of his own vengeful ire. While his fallen comrades returned to the natural cycle of rebirth, being born again as trees, the giant lord lay beneath the land while the immensity of his soul was preserved. By the time we meet the present giant lord, he has been reduced to a form that eerily resembles his nemesis and contemporary, Vendrick. Physically hollowed, he is at the cusp of rebirth. The last giant had such an unwavering soul, even by the time we meet him in the original timeline, he is left standing, having persisted blatant torture and imprisonment. If we're able to measure him by the time that we actually meet him in the game, he is a shallow experience when compared to what is spoken of for his former self. At the end of his life, this battle is likely to be a favour, resting his vengeful soul, allowing him the rest he deserves. This in many ways echoes the state we meet Vendrick, except the last giant, unlike Vendrick, fought to the bitter end with his soul intact, whereas the Vendrick we meet is rendered completely soulless, fearing his inability to wave off Nishandra's influence. This is why the last giant ranks higher than Vendrick.
In a change of pace, the next up is the flexile sentry, a much more enigmatic being. Understanding the strength of the flexile sentry requires combining environmental analysis alongside the mostly limited descriptive context provided by item descriptions. The flexile sentry is initially described as a merciless creature whose purpose is to punish the undead. Not unlike many of the other entries on this list, what distinguishes the flexile sentry is their physicality. Combining various limbs that hold distinctly torturous weapons such as the warped sword, arced sword and barbed club. Although the Flexile Sentry was not duted purely to torture people, its prowess in doing so would fix an air of authority to their presence overall. It's hard to understand where exactly the Flexile Sentries were first introduced to the world, likely commissioned much before we even arrive in Drang Lake. We see their presence throughout various aspects of the timeline in various kingdoms from Drang Lake all the way to Elaim Lois. This helps us understand the sheer influence the flexile sentries were able to draw through the ages, and regardless of the mystery as to who commissioned these beings first, the persistence and consistent use through various powerful kingdoms help us understand how strong these beings truly were. Dutied by kingdoms to act as sentries while prisoners were transported by boats, they are for the most part above average prison guards and are thus let down by a mostly mundane set of distinct abilities. On the note of high-ranking knights commissioned with specific duties, we have a slightly complex entry in the Ruined Sentinels. The Ruined Sentinels are a class of beings that are, according to item descriptions, likely reanimated souls encased in plates of armour, duty to watch over the undead prisoners of the Lost Bastille. Less significant than our in-game encounter with these beings would suggest, it seems they are as mundane as the Flexile Sentries. However, there is a caveat I'm willing to concede to the Ruined Sentinels we encounter in boss form. Carrying the names Yahim, Alessi and Rich, it's likely these specific sentinels were either strong or influential enough to command names of their own. Likely bearing the souls of greater than average beings, the trio we meet in the Lost Bastille are distinguished in their own right and actually harbour unique movesets to other ruined sentinels we find in Drang Lake. Adorned with brass armoury, they are tall, agile and mostly orthodox in their ability to fight. Utilising fast movement and specific to the ones we meet in the Lost Bastille, unique uses of their shield too. Mundane in the face of their competition, their placement is elevated as it's likely these are not just high ranking guards of a prison, but ones that were strong enough, be it through their soul or earned merit, to warrant individuality in the form of names. Still slightly on theme, the next entry is the Belfry Gargoyles. Harkening back to the events of the first game and likely close relatives to the Bell Gargoyles of Lordran, the Belfry Gargoyles share many aesthetic and duty-based similarities as the Bell Gargoyles. It's very unlikely that the Belfry Gargoyles are the exact same gargoyles we encounter in Lordran. However, the Gargoyle Biden does indicate that their design and weaponry is likely an imitation of the original gargoyles. As the original Bell Gargoyles were created by Gwyn himself, these were likely created by a much lesser being named Ven. It's unlikely the Belfry Gargoyles can stand as tall as their predecessor did though. Regardless, however, they do share many strengths originally associated with the Bell Gargoyles, utilising forces of lightning and weaponry that call forth the same strengths. The Bell Gargoyles were anything but standout bosses in Dark Souls 1, and in the same breath, the Belfry Gargoyles, although powerful in context to other beings in Drang Lake, stand quite shallow in comparison to many of the other bosses. This is slightly offset by the fact that you face five of these guys in one go, which is why they hold this position on the list. Vendrick prided much of the ranking of his knights on sheer strength. It's the sole indicator for how he viewed their worth in Drang Lake. Many knights would rise to distinction from Velstart, Raim, and even the Looking Glass Knight, but some would not find the name distinction the way the previously mentioned would. Some very talented warriors would go on to become pursuers on the virtue of their affliction, others would become lowly guards, stone soldiers, cyan soldiers, and royal guards. But between common and namely distinct lies the elite knights of Vendrick. 
Many of the elite knight class of Drang Lake would go on to become dragon riders, members of Vendrick's royal guard. These knights would rise the ranks of Vendrick's guard by demonstrating what the dragon rider bow describes as inhuman strength. But a more notable distinction of these knights was their ability to ride wyverns, likely something similar to the guardian drakes we find later in the game. By the time we reach Drang Lake, however, these dragon riders would be very much dragonless and dismounted, guarding key locations in Drang Lake, likely on the orders of their king. Still wielding weapons likely fashioned for utility upon drakes, they are equipped with large halberds, twin blades, and bows. On the merit that these beings are namely elite amongst the rank of Vendrick's knights, we can assume they hold more strength than other beings that lack such description, such as the ruined sentinels, and may even trump the infamous highly specialised pursuers while they were in their wyvern riding prime. However, the dragon riders we meet are ironically dragonless, and it is on this merit that we can assume their position in the strength of all things is greatly hindered, rendered to just very strong knights distinctly standing out amongst other, more common knights. The origins of the Demon of Song is hard to gauge, impossible even, as Dark Souls 2 offers little in the way of knowing where exactly this being came from. We learn from dialogue and item descriptions that the Demon of Song was born somewhat non-malicious, but somewhere down the line gained a taste for human flesh. Fearing the demon's threat to humans, priestesses of Amana would seal the demon away. However, the priestesses in charge of this had little in the way of heirs to take on their duty and eventually died off, inadvertently allowing the demon to escape. The demon itself is less of an aggressive predator and relies more so on luring victims to its domain to utilise the advantage of its playing field to kill and consume its unfortunate victims. Eventually the demon would adopt the songs of the Milfinito in an attempt to lure victims in a more proactive way. The Milfinito by this point had become hollow and the songstresses voiceless, giving the demon perfect grounds to imitate this without rousing suspicion. Living at the base of the home of the Milfinito, the Demon of Song would sing and lure victims in, and by the time that we meet it, we are in the same predicament as many victims before us already. In assessing the strength of the demon, we can note that it's likely a being of some degree of power-related distinction. The residents of Amana clearly knew of the threat of the Demon of Song, and instead of killing it, had to find another means of forcing it from causing further harm. Even by the time we meet it, it remains unchallenged by both the Milfinito or priestesses and Archdrake knights found close to it, indicating it bore enough strength to wave off the potential repercussions from some quite formidable forces. Forces. However, there is a likelihood the Milfinito themselves did not see the songs of the demon as an entirely bad thing, as it was a continuation of a melody they themselves commissioned. In truth, the only means of equating its strength is on the basis that it has lasted so long without being killed by likely opposing forces surrounding it. We also learn that from the item descriptions, it has a very large pool of victims under its belt. On the merit of its size, status of a being that has lived as long as it has, and the extent of its victims, the Demon of Song earns itself this position on the list, with the caveat that if there is any new details found out about exactly the extent of its power, it would likely likely land much higher on the list. I'll make this one quick, as everything already mentioned about the Dragon Riders have been mentioned not too much earlier. Essentially, the reason the Twin Dragon Riders are higher here is that there is two of them. Utilising the dynamic use of a bow-wielding Dragon Rider and a Twin Blade-wielding one, their threat level is raised to some extent. However, nothing to what they would have been if at least even one of these guys were mounted on a fire-breathing drake in open air. Originally not lordly at all, members of the Old Iron King's hunting team, the Skeleton Lords, were humans tasked with capturing all the undeads during the undead hunts. Incredibly talented at their heinous task, the Skeleton Lords captured many undead and are likely the leading force in the imprisonment of undeads in the Huntsman Cops. 
However, in a cruel twist of irony, the captors began to resemble the captive. Eventually turning hollow, they would lose memory of their original purpose. And as the skeleton lord's soul suggests, once they became overcome by the very curse they sought to oppress, they would assume the position of the skeleton lords, watching over and commanding their previously captivated undead victims, and forming an undead army to rule over the huntsman cops. The majority of the strength of the Skeleton Lords lay in their ability to command the thousands of undead beings armed with very ordinary sets of weaponry. They utilise pyromancy, scythes and halberds. It is in the ability to collectively command such a large portion of undead beings that position the Skeleton Lords so high on the list, as it's clear the influence was strong enough to look over a major portion of Drang Lake. However, holding little in the way of individual strength and being confined by a mostly ordinary army of tortured undead hollows, the Skeleton Lords are unlikely the greatest threat we face in Dark Souls 2, but definitely a force to be reckoned with within the circumstances that we meet them in, right at the heart of the Huntsman Cops, landing them this position on the list. So far we have spoken much on Vendrick, but the story of Drang Lake has some much deeper cuts that bear equal mention than that of Vendrick. The next entry on this list is Aldia, the scholar of the first sin. The narrative history of Drang Lake begins with Vendrick, but it was Aldia who sought to write the end. Aldia was the incredibly gifted brother of Vendrick, not gifted in his combat acumen, but immensely intelligent resourceful, and most importantly, ambitious. Aldia would initially come to prominence adjacent to his brother. As Vendrick built Drang Lake on the souls of the Four Lords, it was Aldia who built the roads to Drang Lake's success. Aldia's first great act would be to utilise the knowledge of the giants to build the golems. Beings charged with souls, they would build Drang Lake Castle and pave the route to the kiln of the first flame. However, as the curse of the undead began to take prominence in Dark Souls, Vendrick, in desperation, came to his brother for a solution. Aldia's first act in this was to research the source of the undead curse, and what he uncovered was the history of the world. Beings born from the dark, Lord Souls at the precipice of the Age of Fire, tracking the humanity of every human to the Dark Soul and the Fursive Pygmy. Aldir was second only to Karth in understanding the undead curse as a byproduct of Gwyn's betrayal. It was Gwyn who cursed humanity out of fear of nature's course. Gwyn feared the coming of the Age of Dark and selfishly cursed humanity with the Dark Sign, a sigil that trapped the souls of the progenitors of man from realising its full potential. In this, humans, descendants of the Pygmies, were destined to be confined by the preservation of the Age of Fire, an age that intrinsically oppressed their birthright. Gwyn's actions were the first sin, and this revelation would become Aldia's namesake as the scholar of the first sin. Aldia, stumped at a means of overcoming the dark sign, began to look further back, before the Lords. He would eventually come to the knowledge that overcoming this curse required disassociating with the nature Gwyn had subverted. He sought what the everlasting dragons had, existing outside the framework of Gwyn's actions, a place where nature sits stagnant and unhollowing. Aldia would go on to experiment and Gwyn would commission his own place of study that facilitated these experiments. In desperation, Aldia would experiment on all beings from giants to humans in finding a means of combining the soul of man with the essence of ancient dragons. Vendrick would learn of Aldia's actions and shun his brother's means of attaining knowledge and both siblings would abandon each other for the rest of time. Aldia unshackled would burst two notable creations, the Ancient Dragon and Shanalot. 
The ancient dragon utilized the remnants of everlasting dragons and a giant soul and would manifest into a being that almost shared a one-to-one -one resemblance with the everlasting dragons of the old. However, no matter how much Aldia and his company revered this being, it did nothing to stave off the undead curse. On this relative success, Aldia would attempt the same, this time with a human, birthing Shanalot a being birthed from a baby girl and the essence of dragons. Her existence, much like the ancient dragon, did little to affect the hollowing of Drang Lake, however. Out of ideas, Aldir would settle his ambitions and fall deep into a nihilism, accepting the curse as a new way of life and the cycle of fire and dark as an inherent law of nature. Aldia meets us throughout the game having taken the form of a fiery conglomeration of mass, likely due to exposure to the eldritch truths of the world and close proximity to countless experimentations. Acting as a doomsayer, he follows us through to the end and when we meet him as an opponent at the gates of the first flame, he battles us, utilising manifestations of fire and mutated tendrils. However, according to the law, there is no indication that Aldia was much of a combatant. His fighting prowess is never mentioned and it is unlikely that he ever posed much of a threat as an individual. However, his new understanding of the world and close proximity to the eldritch truth of the world and the first flame has granted him powers of fire acting as his primary defence mechanism. The challenge is likely to be of a very medium level of threat relative to his bloodline and position and influence in the world. Aldir is one of the greatest bosses in Dark Souls. He's fleshed out with contacts, backstories and relationships with other beings in the game. Our next entry is not one of such bosses. The Guardian Dragon is less a dragon and more so akin to a distant relative of an everlasting dragon, adopting more Drake-like characteristics. The Drakewing Ultra Greatsword tells us Drakes are likely descendants of ancient dragons, and although their strength pales in comparison to what is described in legends, to mere humans, they are still mighty beasts. And it is in this section of the description that gives us the best insight into the power of this beast. As benign as its story is, it's still a descendant of one of the greatest beings to ever grace the world of Dark Souls. Posing a much greater threat than ordinary knights and even sentinels of the land, the Guardian Drake has the ability to breathe fire, greater size to other drakes of the series and even maintains the ability to fly. Dragons in Dark Souls have consistently been beings of great strength and it's no illusion why this is. As most dragons we see in this game are distant relatives of beings originally believed to be immortal and one that required the combined strength of the furtive pygmy, Gwyn, Nito, Isolith and the armies of these lords to bring down. Even distant relatives of these primordial beings are threats worthy of the ages and it is why the guardian dragon ran so high on this list. When speaking on iconic encounters from the second installment of Dark Souls, many are likely to point out the all-elusive pursuers. Little is known about the individual identities of the pursuers themselves, however what we do know from item descriptions is that they are likely beings that hail from a region named Alcan. Originally incredibly proficient warriors wielding weapons that are exclusively utilised by only the most talented swordsmen. As per the description of their sword and shield. As human warriors of great acclaim in their original land, they would succumb eventually to the curse of hollowing. However, unlike regular denizens, they instead fought back against the hollowing through what would be seen as very conventional means in the land of Drang Lake at the time. Taking up arms against the very concept of hollowing, they would enroll in the profession of pursuers. Knights that would seek the bearers of the sign and will not 
not rest until slain. The cruel irony was not lost on the beings though, as the curse of hollowing was consistently misunderstood, and this misunderstanding is a heavy theme in Dark Souls too. And they are too just a victim of this cultural naivety. Believing they could repent for their own curse, they would slay other hollows while hollowing themselves, and held the faith that the sins that supposedly caused the curse would eventually be lifted. Their hollowing is evident when looking at their fight style. Utilising a truly unique moveset, fast movement and incredible agility, they also bear the power to use hexes, a distant calling card of beings that have had their humanity run wild. The combination of their prowess, details about their swordmanship, utility in using hexes and their unchallenged presence in Drang Lake, the pursuers hold a very strong position in this list as warriors above many other warriors. The complexity of this entry relates heavily to the lack of direct context we get on Scorpioness Najka. The rundown goes like this, Scorpioness Najka is likely a being born from the experimentations of Seath. Maintaining hybrid characteristics, we are not too sure about the origins of Najka. Is she a being born from Seath's experimentations or a mutated version of a former self that Seath had caused. Regardless, there are very notable cues in the lore that we can use to assume her overall strength. Tied closely with Man Scorpion Tark, many item descriptions and thematic elements such as Najka's ability to utilise the old spells of Big Hat Logan indicate that she has a very close affiliation to the albino archdragon, and therefore some degree of primordial strength. In the game, we learn that Najka is able to harness the powers of Big Hat Logan in combat. Utilising the near primal sorceries of the Vinheim Dragon School, she flexes much of her strength to powers we only ever see in Big Hat Logan, such as the Homing Soul Mass and Soul Spear. On the merit of conjuring the powers of Big Hat Logan, we can assume her strength is comparable to some degree to that of Logan's. Logan would become one of the most legendary figures in the entirety of the series, birthing sects of followers and researchers that hold influence all the way to the final instalment of the game. We also learn that she is likely the direct creation of Seath, as when we meet her husband Man Scorpion Tark, he tells us that both himself and Najka were born a very long time ago, and upon the defeat of the Duke's dear Freya, who subsequently drops the pale Drake soul, he thanks us for defeating their master, likely referring to Seath rather than Freya. When we combine their direct descendants to the albino archdragon, a being that harboured an aspect of Prime Gwyn's soul and responsible for the creation of crystal sorcery, and her ability to utilise the spells of Big Hat Logan to a degree we only see again in the final instalment of the game in the form of the Crystal Mages, Najka is a being that definitely deserves a position this high on the list. Although the next entry is likely to be the hardest boss in the entire game, and probably the whole series altogether gameplay-wise, the lore for these two pets of the king put them much further away from that. Lud and Zalun were two of the Ivory King's seven pets, tasked to watch over the frigid outskirts, offering the respite of death to those exiled to its barren conditions. Likely much weaker will than their more powerful sibling Arva, they became encapsulated by the dark of their queen and began inhabiting the wild humanity characterised by this dark, enveloping them in a darkish hue. There is a theory that their darkening hue was caused by the countless souls they would have to kill in the frigid outskirts, and by proximity would find more humanity, likely hollowed humans, in their assigned territory. However, it's more like a thematic connection between the lingering origins of the Queen, a story we'll go into much more depth when we speak about the Ivory King. 
Unlike Arva, their distinction is less amenable to their overall strength, displaying much of the skill that Arva has, dampened by the fact that they were given less important roles as described in their souls. As the video progresses, I'll have a better chance at describing why Arva was a much more powerful being. Arva's role held parallels to the greats of even Veldstadt and Reim, whereas Lud and Zullen befitted a lower ranking position as merciful executioners for the exiled. However, both Lud and Zolan together are forces worthy of note, demonstrating much of the prowess we can come to appreciate in the greater Arva, such as spell casting and a large frame complemented with incredible nimbleness, and when we equate both beings as a duo boss battle, we can happily secure their position here on the list. The next entry is the only entry not only on this list but the entirety of the series that has absolutely no item descriptions or written or narrative context explaining their origins, source of power or even influence in this world. The only context we are given is that they are made up of a grave robber, ancient soldier and old explorer, and that we meet them likely hollowed in the sunken kingdom. Understanding their relative strength is somewhat of a difficult task, but there are some clues here we can draw from, that being their armour. The distinctiveness of their armour suggests the trio are likely well-travelled journeymen, acquiring an impressive array of armaments such as Havel Set, Dragon Tooth and a Dragon Hunter Bow. Though their story is long forgotten, it's likely the trio were a band of adventurers that saw some quite impressive victories, and it's a shame that their stories are nowhere to be found, as the group seems like they've really lived through this universe, met some great scenes, but as it is the story of all and dead, became fated to a meaningless end, but somehow still stuck together likely bound by the hardened memories these folk have accumulated together, persevering somewhere deep in their hollowed minds. The fact that they wield the omniments that they do demonstrate a great degree of skill, and in truth, this is all we have. And for me, this is enough to put them this high on the list, as I'm hopeful that this ragtag group of individuals could tell us beautiful stories of their adventures over a bonfire, in a world where they retained their humanity. The next entry is as much a tragic story as it is a testament to the strength of a being stuck in the zenith of obsession. Mitha, the baneful queen, is a being we meet deep in the earthen peak. Watching over a tribe of mannequin donned assassins, her story spans much further in the past than that though. Laddersmith Gilligan gives us context as to Mitha's current form. He tells us she was once the fairest in the land and would fall in love with an unnamed king of a neighbouring land. Theories are rife as to the identity of this king from Alcan to the Iron King. What matters to us though is that her love for this figure of royalty was unreciprocated. This rejection would become consolidated once the king, so adorned by Mitha, would wed another. Mitha, plagued by anguish and jealousy, would attempt to win the king by highlighting what she knew was her most distinguishing characteristic, her beauty. This would push Mitha to obsession and she would become accustomed to the vast consumption of poison. Relentlessly pursuing beauty as a means to win back her only love, she would become completely taken a hold by this poison and it would transform her into a serpent. The origins of this poison are hard to truly say as the item descriptions from her bent blade suggests. Was it the poison found deep within the earth? or the passion that consumed her heart. Regardless, this would eventually transform her completely, and Mitha would assume a new home within the poisonous shallows of the earthen peak. 
Notations on her strength are in two forms. The first are the fact that she is one of the few bosses that are able to utilize poisonous elements in her repertoire. Facing Mitha in the place that we do is likely much more of a difficult endeavor just on the back of this reality. Secondly, and likely more importantly, she is likely to have become a being of recognisable strength, maintaining dominance of the region we find her in. Her influence would be grand enough that she was able to command enough strength to maintain a monopoly of power over the area, as the mannequin mask tells us that she likely defiled her subjects and turned their remnants into what we now know as the mannequin assassins. As the remaining dominant force of a central region of Drang Lake, neighbouring colossal kingdoms such as that of the Iron Keep, Mitha is able to utilise the unique environmental hazards of the Earthen Peak while also being wholly responsible for the creation of the Mannequin Assassins. In this, Mitha firmly finds herself this spot on the list. The undead chariot was less of a being of war and more so a means to torture. A tool during the old Iron King's reign, the executioner chariot was commissioned to pulverize undeads endlessly. Often accompanied by necromancers used to resurrect the unfortunate hollows to ensure they would indeed suffer endlessly. The chariot itself is the main threat here, and it's likely the Old Iron King's greatest means of torturing the most amount of undeads during the entirety of his reign. Boasting a large size, immense force, and an undying will to fulfil its job. The Executioner Chariot Soul tells us the only purpose to the Executioner Chariot was to torture the undead. Unlikely holding much capacity in the way of a head-on threat, however, we meet the Undead Chariot in its own arena. A circular hall perfectly aligned with its method of torture. In this, we have to face this challenge not on the battlefield, but as a perspective undead that has found themselves trapped in the same predicament as the poor victims left to suffer before them. The legionnaire that sits atop this chariot is also specifically armed with a crossbow that tells us it was created to protect from possible retribution from any undead that chose to revolt against their torturous existence. In this, we have to battle the executioner chariot in exactly the place they want us to be in, trapped in a circular torture hall with a crossbow pointed towards our head, endlessly looped by a spiked chariot. For those familiar with Dark Souls 2, this next entry will come as somewhat of a surprise. The Royal Rat Authority is likely the primary offensive arm of the Rat Kingdom. In understanding the strength of this being, we have to first look at what the Rat Kingdom was and is at the time our paths cross. The Rat Kingdom was founded on the back of the mostly ordinary Rat King. The Rat King is known as the ancient ruler of the Underworld, having grown so far in influence that the Underworld of Drang Lake became canonically his domain. Eventually, the Rat King would develop an alliance with the Overworld through an agreement with a certain chieftain. We don't know for certain who this chieftain was, but it's likely that this was not Vendrick, but a ruler who predates even him. As Gilligan tells us, the grave of the saints that lay in the Rat's kingdom date back much before Vendrick, and even before Vendrick came to the island that would eventually be called Drang Lake. Eventually, however, within this timeline, the Overworld would go against their peaceful accord and come to the Underworld seeking the riches of the Rat King's domain. We don't know exactly how successful the Overworld was in this campaign, but we do know the Rat King was able to fend off the threat and remains in control of the lower section of Drang Lake, acting as Vendrick's Underworld counterpart. Many beings would come to aid the Rat King. From Mastodon, Gurms, Rats and even humans, a covenant was created to honour the ranks of those who would join. 
There is little clarity on what forces are at work that allows the Rat King to maintain dominance of the underworld, but we can say for certain that the Royal Rat Authority has a large hand in its preservation. As there is little context clues about the strength of the Royal Rat Authority, we can assume its strength on the back of the strength of the Rat Kingdom, and see the Authority as its arm or main source of power that offers its dominance and monopoly over the Underworld Domain. In many ways, the Rat Authority is to the Rat King what Velstat is to Vendrick, and the preservation of the Rat Kingdom, even to the point we encounter it, gives us insight into the true strength of this being. Built much larger than its regular counterparts, the Royal Rat Authority is colossal, ferocious, and the main force of power for the Underworld, landing it such an unlikely high position on this list. The next entry is a familiar one. Throughout this video, you will see that Dark Souls 2 has a recurring theme of mighty souls from the original instalment, reappearing in various forms in Drang Lake, from Nito, Seath, Isolith, and even Gwyn. But the next entry shows that Lord Souls were not the only souls powerful enough to transcend their original timeline. The origins of the old Dragon Slayer is and will remain to be a hot button debate with no clear end. What we do know is that a being exists in Hyde's Tower of Flame that shares an almost one to one striking resemblance to Ornstein. With a darkened hue, we meet the old Dragon Slayer behind the gates of the Blue Cathedral. However, can we say for certain that this is Ornstein? This is unlikely, as we learn in the final instalment of the game that Ornstein would meet his ultimate demise at the Archdragon's Peak. Interestingly, this Ornstein is found as a corpse with only his armour remaining. The armour we find in the later instalments retains its golden complexion, indicating that the Dragon Slayer we meet in Drang Lake is very unlikely to be Ornstein himself, rather a careful imitation. Even though the old Dragon Slayer drops a soul reminiscent of Ornstein's, the soul itself doesn't for sure indicate that this is Ornstein's. Instead, it tells us the old Dragon Slayer is reminiscent of a certain knight that appears in old legends. The key word here being reminiscent. Likely the being we find here is a very talented Dragon Slayer that manifested much of his own strength from the tales of Ornstein. In Dark Souls, memories themselves hold some degree of material potency, as a major form of spellcasting is miracles, essentially stories of the past that have the power to materialise effect. Using this knowledge, the old Dragon Slayer, in my opinion, is not Ornstein. In this, we can assess the strength of the old Dragon Slayer void of the merit that he shares the monumental strength of Gwyn's most favoured knight. However, this does not detract from much of the strength we can assume the old Dragon Slayer does have. Bearing the ability to utilise lightning miracles, a proficiency with a weapon very similar to that of Ornstein's, and skill to indicate he is more than just a talent imitator, the old dragon slayer likely also a proficient slayer of dragons is alone in Drang Lake and in fact the entire timeline as a being that got the closest to mimicking the strength of a truly revolutionary and legendary figure. A being that came closest to truly mimicking the strength of the legendary captain of Gwyn's Knights, and interestingly also able to utilise some degree of dark spellcasting, the old Dragon Slayer commands a prestigious position on this list above other notable knights such as the Pursuer. As in the case of the Pursuer, many knights were able to join these ranks, but only one was able to justify Ornstein's title. As a final point, if we look back onto this very list with the understanding that the Guardian Dragon was likely more ferocious than most talented knights, and then consider that the old Dragon Slayer was likely a being that had numerous of such beings under his kill list, we can say for certain the old Dragon Slayer deserves this spot on the list. The next entry comes with a caveat. 
I will not be discussing the identity of the Rotten. There are so many well fleshed out theories indicating it's Pharos, or maybe residents of Shulva who fled the poisoned city. Regardless of which you believe is canon, the truth is there is little canonical evidence to say either is correct. And thankfully for the sake of this video, the identity of the Rotten has little context relating to his overall strength. In Dark Souls, Nito is one of the original lords who found the fiery Lord Souls during the Age of Ancients. Known as the first of the dead, Nito had control over death, disease and decay. His contributions to the revolutionary force that would bring about the Age of Fire were only comparable to Gwyn, Isolith and the Furtive Pygmy. The consequences of his power can be seen throughout the first instalment of the game and the monumental impact his power was able able to play in the world is visibly one of the most potent. In Dark Souls 2, the concept of soul fragments being carried over and influencing different beings is a thematic continuation. Within the context of Dark Souls 2's lore, the rotten strength is deeply tied to these very fragments of souls, most notably is the soul of Nito. We know Nito's soul is associated to the rotten as the old dead one soul is dropped by the rotten if defeated on NG+. It also shares a striking similarity to Nito in physical design. Unfortunately, the Rotten itself shows little similarity to Nito in his ability to fight. There is no indication either in item descriptions, lore prompts, or gameplay to suggest the Rotten has any prowess in any of Nito's abilities in necromancy, decay, or disease. We also know Dark Souls 2 is not shy in indicating the strength of the beings that would inherit the Lord Souls from the previous game, as example through Duke's dear Freya's ability to use primal sorceries. For this reason, the rotten strength is only and wholly tied to its size and affiliations with the soul of Nito, ultimately realising its position on the list so uncharacteristically low for an inheritor of a Lord Soul. Right, I'm going to skip most of the reason why this is here because I'll give you more than enough context as to the strength the Smelter Demon possess when I talk about the Smelter Demon from the main game. I just want you to remember that the reason the DLC Smelter Demon ranks lower is because it was likely a much earlier iteration that one did not yet have the power to harness the Fire Magus Eagle originally intended, and two, its achievements pale in comparison to the main game Smelter Demon. But but as it is likely similar enough to the Smelter Demon of the main game, it earns merits as being a colossal entity that deserves a position this high on the list. The next entry is the first on the list that features a distinct knight of Vendrick's order of warriors. Although unnamed, the Looking Glass Knight is one of a kind. He was King Vendrick's lieutenant who served alongside the king during his rule over Drang Lake. Initially positioned as a challenge for anyone who sought the recognition as a knight of the kingdom, the Looking Glass Knight would take on a different duty when the curse of the undead returned to the kingdom, and Nishandra's real intentions of using Vendrick to commandeer the power of the throne of want was revealed. Using the description of the thorned greatsword, we understand that Vendrick would one day flee from the castle and subsequently ditch his kingly armaments in Amana and hide himself away in the crypts, subverting the gaze of Nashandra and staving off her access to the influence to the throne. We also learn that Vendrick would entrust the Looking Glass Knight to be one of the last lines of defence against anyone who would come searching for Amana and the throne. It's likely Vendrick placed the Looking Glass Knight here for two reasons. The first, as mentioned, would be to defend against Nashandra's force from getting to him, and secondly, to act as a test for any chosen undead that sought the throne, ensuring they were strong enough to take on the mantle of the throne of want, but also fend off against Nashandra as she sought to usurp the power of the throne. 
The most distinct strength of the Looking Glass Knight is its ability to utilize the unique effects of his shield, the King's Mirror. This allowed the Looking Glass Knight to act as a bridge between the interconnected timeline of Dark Souls, and from gameplay cues it's likely the Looking Glass Knight was able to summon upon other knights of Vendrick to aid him in battle. As a member of the Royal Guard, the Looking Glass Knight is likely only succeeded in strength by Valstart and Rain, able to utilize the immensity of the King's mirror and being of such great strength that Vendrick himself appointed him to be one of the last bastions of defense against the antithetical forces of Nishandra. The Looking Glass Knight easily assumes such a high placement on this list. For our next entry, I want to begin by dispelling a major theory that has made quite some ground with this boss. Though the boss is never explicitly told to be a descendant of prominent bosses from Dark Souls 1, many have come to assume a few theories that indicate they are. The most prominent theory is that the Dark Lurker is in fact a reincarnation of some aspect of Manus. This is incredibly unlikely for a few reasons though. Firstly, all descendants already mentioned in the game have souls that share some striking resemblance to their spiritual ancestor, such as the Old Iron King to Gwyn, Seath to Freya, and even Ashandra to Manus. This is simply not the case for the Dark Lurker. Secondly, the Dark Lurker has a clear affinity to faith, dropping a dragon chime that reads, this chime sat long in the dark chasm, but still one senses a sublime purity. Only those with the deepest faith can wield this chime, indicating the being is likely well versed in a clerical past. Some have argued that the Dark Lurker is not Manus, but a reincarnation of the Four Kings. Though this theory holds some relative value due to many gameplay similarities such as appearance of clones and the fact that its soul can transpose into Life Drain Patch, the Dark Lurker is much more likely to be a being that ventured into the dark as some campaign against the elements of the Abyss. Equipped with a Dragon Chime and a high resistance to the dark, the Dark Lurker likely waged a war against the dark and found the power of life drain in their descent. There is a reason why the Dark Diver, Covenant and Grindal reward the player for defeating the being, and why it can only be summoned upon by bringing light to the abyss. With this in mind, when speaking about the strength of the Dark Lurker, we are talking about a being that has three essential characteristics. One, this being has harnessed the power of life drain, an art that was feared even by Gwyn during his prime and had the potential of challenging the very fibre of the Age of Fire. Two, the Dark Lurker was able to bring convictions of faith deep into the abyss and disrupt it enough that even devout followers such as the Dark Divers saw it as a threat worthy of extinction, bringing praise to anyone able to bring the being down. And finally, number three, the Dark Lurker is likely an incredible miracle caster. As the Dragon Chime indicates, only the most faithful were able to utilize this chime's potential. This combined with the Dark Lurker's ability to use pyromancy and even some level of dark magic, likely as a byproduct of exposure to the dark, put the Dark Lurker as one of the greater beings in Dark Souls 2. A combination of the ancient art of life drain, the ability to challenge Dark Souls' most powerful antithetical force in the form of the Abyss, and a proficiency in spellcasting, faith-based and otherwise, put the Dark Lurker in a prestigious position on this list. Many heroes in Dark Souls 2 have little context as to their origins. The narrative's strength lies in what they offer to the acceleration of major aspects of the lore. But for Alon, it wasn't the grand narrative of the lore he accentuated, but the story of one of the greatest kings of the land, the Old Iron King. On the precipice of the Old Iron King's victory over Ven, Sir Alon would find himself in the company of the ambitious Lord, with plans of even greater things altogether. Allured to his affinity to greatness, Alon, an extremely talented warrior from the East, would aid the King in building an empire to overshadow those that came before and set the standard for those that would come after. 
Alon would offer counsel to the king and quickly took charge of the old Iron King's army. Training the warriors in the way of eastern warfare, he would teach them the ability to use katanas and great bows, a distinction that would solidify the Iron King's military strength in the world. The old Iron King would eventually go on to create a great kingdom and on this quest would find the Iron Scepter, a means to take control of molten earth itself, and most importantly, the manipulation of iron. Starry-eyed, the king would abuse this revelation and build a kingdom to match his inflating ego, exporting his own unfounded ambition to his domain, bringing greed and gluttony to his people. Alon, likely distasteful at his king's new image, left the kingdom and sought refuge in a land not too far away, bringing some of the Iron King's own knights trained by Alon to watch over his new home. This refuge, however, was peaceful for a very short period of time, as once the old Iron King would learn of this treachery, he would leave the kingdom and seek vengeance, and vengeance he would find. Tracking Alan and decimating the traitors, he would bring down the Eastern Warrior, something we can witness firsthand in the memories of the king in the game. Though ultimately defeated, when assessing Alon's strength, do not be dissuaded by his shortcomings to the one who would bear the soul of Gwyn, as it's less of an indictment on his combat prowess and more so a triumph of the power of the Old Iron King. Sir Alon single-handedly trained the knights of the Old Iron King's domain from mere warriors to stalwart knights. We learn from his weaponry that even on defeat, the Old Iron King would give Alon's namesake to those warriors, likely shameful at his actions that were blinded by anger and also a testament to the lasting influence of Alon's way of combat. On the virtue of what we know about the lasting prowess of the Alon Knights and the distinct nature of Alon's abilities and special characteristics of his weaponry, we can easily assume Alon this position on the list. Arva was one of seven of the king's pets tasked in the later life in service of the kingdom. Arva found itself at the gates of the king's throne room. It's unclear as to if Arva was placed here before the king's sacrifice or after, but what is clear is that it was given the task of overlooking the queen herself. Amongst the seven pets, it's likely that Arva was the greatest of the seven, in charge of the most prestigious role and harbouring the distinct quality of invisibility. We can compare Arva in many ways as the contemporaries of beings such as Velstart and Raim. As mentioned, the real distinguishing characteristic outside its specific high-ranking duty is that Arva bear the ability to remain invisible to any of whom that did not possess the eyes of the priestesses, a powerful difference that would add monumental strength to our face-off against it. Gaining such an eye alone would be a difficult task, and even if you were able to obtain this, the fight itself would likely resemble something similar to her contemporaries. Although assessing Arva's strength as comparable to either Velstart or Raim would be dishonest as Velstart and Raim have done more than just existing as Vendrick's loyal guards hosting a resume that truly overshines just their jobs in Drang Lake. In any case, Arva utilises powers of frost that are characterised in the description of the ivory straight sword, and when we add this to the context as to her role in one of the greatest kingdoms in Ferosa, Arva consolidates a position easily this high on the list. Found in the height of the Sinner's Rise, the Lost Sinner's origins are one of the greater mysteries in Dark Souls 2. There are, however, many theories as to who she truly is. The Lost Sinner is a being found locked in the Lost Bastille, likely locked out of her own volition as the Sinner's Rise has an exit that is wide open. Draped in attire described as penal garments, we know the lost sinner is atoning for actions, but we never get a direct description of this. 
The soul of the lost sinner tells us that the lost sinner eternally punishes herself for her sins of her past. And the penal straitjacket adds that no one truly knows what reason she is punishing herself. However, there are some great clues we get through the environment and cutscenes that indicate a primary motive. On our introduction to the lost sinner, a peculiar parasite seems to have found a host in the lost sinner's eye, a being that directly resembles the remnants of the Witch of Isolith and the Bed of Chaos. If we hearken back to my previous video on this topic, we learn that the Witch of Isolith, in an attempt at preserving the Age of Fire, attempted to recreate the first flame, but in a cruel twist of fate, created the Chaos Flame, a mutating force that devastated herself, her children, and birthed a new force that directly contended against the forces of the Age of Fire. It's likely that the sinner is atoning not for her own sins, but rather the Witch of Isolith's sins in the form of the creation of the Chaos Flame. Associations to the Witch of Isolith even extend to our fight with the Lost Sinner, as in the NG Plus playthrough of the game, the Lost Sinner is able to summon forth pyromancers, and we know that pyromancy is directly linked to the manipulation of the original Chaos Flame. To add to this, on defeat during the NG Plus playthrough, the Lost Sinner drops the old Witch's soul, sharing an identical design to the Witch of Isolith's soul from the first game and the namesake to match. It's increasingly likely too that the lost sinner may have sins of her own relating to fire, and the parasite associated with the bed of chaos may have found a host with the lost sinner due to this pre-existing shame harboured by the being. Regardless, what's important here is that we know the lost sinner combines both the strength of her own and the strength of what remains of the bed of chaos and the witch of Isolith's soul. Considering the sheer strength of the bed of chaos from the previous game and the lost sinner's prowess with her unique Ultra Greatsword, we can measure her strength in proximity to the Bed of Chaoses from the first game, giving her a ranking this high on the list. However, her strength is somewhat limited to, say, the Old Iron King due to her self-imposed disabilities. Hailing from a faraway land and of unparalleled beauty, she came to King Vendrick after he had claimed the four Lord Souls and built Drang Lake. A lord to his great king's soul, it was initially unclear as to her intentions. Assuming love as her motivation, she would wed the king and would come extremely close to him. Enough so, he would affectionately claim her to be his dear Chandra. However, Nishandra was no ordinary woman. She was a shard of the now slain Manus. On his death, Manus departed the major aspects of his soul, the Dark Soul, into fragments across the land. These little shards would grow into women. We know of the existence of Nishandra, Ilana and Elsana. It would be Nishandra that would become the most prominent figure in our playthrough, revealing her true colours upon learning of her history with Vendrick and subsequently Vendrick's self-imposed exile. Nishandra was tied directly to the most major aspect of the furtive pygmy, and in this she harboured an immense influence on bearers of humanity. Vendrick being such a prominent human would slowly come under Nishandra's influence and this influence is exactly what led him to the land of the giants to bring back a gift that allowed him to build Dranglake Castle and subsequently create the path to the kiln of the first flame. Nishandra sought to puppeteer the king into taking the throne and using his influence to usher in what is likely an age of the dark. An age where humanity reclaimed the power subverted by Gwyn during the sins of the Age of Fire. Essentially the continued mission of her now slain father and the dark stalker Karth who would awaken him from his slumber. 
However, Vendrick eventually came to know the Queen as a being of the dark and fled the kingdom, departing his soul somewhere she was unlikely to pass and himself in the crypts to hollow in peace away from the influence of his dear Queen. Vendrick likely was much more powerful than Ashandra, but her ability to influence the humanity at the core of his being and the lasting love he had for Nashandra stopped him from forcefully stopping her sly transgressions. Nashandra in relation to strength is likely a very strong entity. In the last video, I demonstrated why Manus ranked as the strongest entity in the game, with the knowledge that his soul would manifest in three queens and the foresight that in the third installment of this game, it would be these fragments of his being that coalesced the ability for us to bring about the Age of Londor. We know even small fragments of this being still command immense levels of power. However, we learn from the Chime of Want that Nashandra and her sisters were likely the smallest of Manus's fragments, as it was the smallest fragments that evolved into human forms this early on, yearning for power and for self-preservation, likely through the powerful soul of kings as proxies. Nishandra's core strength, though powerful, including a repertoire of dark-based spells, according to the law, was not immense. Instead, it was her ability to utilise the magnetism of the Dark Soul that made her such a powerful force, similar to how Manus was able to form the Abyss and the corruption of Ulysil and countless other beings. By the time we meet her, she is her full realised self, harbouring all of her corrupting force. Our largest obstacle would be allowing ourselves the full capacity to directly fight her, as we are human and harbour the same humanity that Nishandra's corrupting influence is so inherently tied to. If overcome though, the challenge itself is likely to be a whisper of what Manus was, but this alone should not be understated, as remember, Manus was the the greatest battle in Dark Souls 1 by a long shot. Yet another fragment of Manus, much like Nishandra, the only other iteration of Manus's legacy we get to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with is Elana. Unlike Nishandra, however, Elana seemed much more successful in her endeavours. In the world of Dark Souls 2, we get to visit three kingdoms with three queens and three kings. All queens bearing Manus's essence, we learn that Manus's ability to influence carried through to his offspring. In the DLC of the game, we get to visit Shulva, the Sanctum City, a kingdom that sits more like a ruin. Built around a sleeping dragon, Shulva had developed many customs around this dragon, holding the colossal being with great reverence. Many customs would ensue and a city would be built around these shared customs. At the heart of this society was the sunken king, Elana his queen, and the sleeping dragon Sin. Sin lay dormant at the heart of the city, and the inhabitants would sing to it as a means of either appeasing it while it slumbers, fearing its wake, or to revere it in the hope that it would grant them some kind of blessing. Dragons in Dark Souls bear primal origins, beings that existed outside the confines of life itself. They harboured abilities that look into the past, and it was these distinct characteristics that many would come to revere. Covenants would emerge and worshippers existed throughout the timeline. We even get to see some of these outside the ancient dragon's shrine in the main game. Nevertheless, Shulva would become such a shrine. Drang Lake existing adjacent to Shulva harboured a different type of reverence for dragons. Both Vendrick and his brother both shared an affinity to dragons as they believed dragons held the clues as to the plight of man, from the undead curse to solutions for war. It is therefore unsurprising to see Vendrick commission a group known as the Drake Blood Knights to seek out the blood of dragons for answers. In time, the Drakeblood Knights would invade Shulva. Led by Yorg, they decimated the kingdom, slew the king, and reached Sin. Yorg would pierce Sin in an attempt at pocketing his blood, but would be met by a disturbing truth. The dragon was filled 
with poison. Upon this realization, Jorg would retreat and leave Shulva, but the poison would forever ravage the kingdom, casting a green mist all over. There are prominent theories to suggest Elana was a cause of the poison and her songs were what filled a dragon with the toxins. Rot and filth are inherent in her design and it's not too far-fetched to say she projected this into the dragon. Her soul states that she laid waiting for the time that the dragon would seek vengeance. We know the fragments of Manus held the properties to corrupt beings to work in their own ends. And it's likely Elana sought to corrupt Sin, but such corruption was caught early by Jorg's campaign. When we find Elana, she is yet singing the dragon into slumber. In the remnants of her kingdom, she has assumed a form reminiscent of her true colours. A rotted being still singing to the dragon as her lover and kingdom is left in ruin. Ilana taking form of a human at the same time as Nishandra is great indication that she likely harbours a similar strength to her sister. The Chime of Want tells us that it was the smallest fragments of Manus that took human form in this age, and Ilana had likely taken form at the same time as Nishandra, indicating a similar capacity of power. Ilana distinctly too is able to summon upon wretched images of other beings to aid her in combat, notably including a mirage of Elstart, hosting spells of disease and decay, she holds a uniqueness to Nishandra. Ilana likely sat adjacent in regard to power to Nishandra though, and her placement sits at exactly the same spot. The next entry is likely Dark Souls' first main community mystery. As the only true indication we get to the scale of everlasting dragons, the ancient dragon is the closest living being we see to that of the true primordial beings. But the closest does not indicate it's exactly as we see. Both Sweet Shalqua and Ashandra enlighten us to the true identity of the dragon as one of an imitation. But not just any imitation one that bears the strength to match its size, which evidently is colossal. So large in fact that it is likely the largest being in the entire game, a size reminiscent of the everlasting dragons from the first ever cutscene in the first installment of the series. We learn that the ancient dragon is in fact, much like many beings in Drang Lake, an experiment by Aldir. Aldir would spend much of his time in his keep far to the east, and his magnus opus was to be the creation of a being that transcended the confines of the undead curse. Of course, what other being than the everlasting dragons would fit this criteria? A being that existed absent of life and death. There is evidence of failed experiments throughout Aldia's Keep, and at the end of our venture through his domain, we find this ancient dragon, perched upon a large platform surrounded by drakes and knights with an affinity for dragons under its command. Even if we consider the ancient dragon as just an imitation, we have to admit it's an incredible one. One that bears reverence by such a large domain of beings. One that is even able to transfer us the ashen mist heart, which is likely an aspect of real everlasting dragons. Something that lets us peer deep into the past, as of course, everlasting dragons do not exist in time as we do. When we utilise this Ashen Mist Heart, we can go back in time, and one peculiar experience from this is meeting an actual dead everlasting dragon. This being sharing a striking resemblance to the ancient dragon we meet bears the real soul of an ancient dragon. In this, we learn the ancient dragon is a much greater replica than we could ever imagine. And on this fact alone, we can assume the ancient dragon, even if it is an imitator, this high of a position on the list. Vendrick had much confidence in the knights of his domain, granting positions of authority to simple warriors who staked their every battle on strength 
alone. Although Vendrick had little affinity to clerical practices, Velstart, a cleric from a distant land, would find himself in a position that put him at the very top of Vendrick's bureaucracy. But how did a cleric, a man of faith, assume a position so close to a sceptic? Close enough that he's frequently described as the Lord's very own shadow. Hailing from the land of Shulva, Velstart, for reasons even he cannot recall, found himself at the foot of Drang Lake. But what we do know is Velstart would eventually find himself in the service of Vendrick, likely during the early years of the kingdom's rise, as it's clear Velstart had left Shulva before the Drakeblood knights would invade the place. Drakebloods that were tied to Drang Lake, likely developed and commissioned by Vendrick himself. It wouldn't be long before Velstart would prove himself to the king, likely much before even the events of the invasion of the land of giants, as through context from the saga of Raim and Velstart, we learn he had already assumed the role as the king's right arm before these events. As Vendrick likely ranked his soldiers on the merit of strength alone, Velstart would have likely already proven himself as one of the mightiest amongst all of Vendrick's knights, even against the odds of being a cleric. Velstart, armed in gold-plated armour and a sacred chime, climbed these ranks right to the top, beating out legendary warriors such as even that of the Looking Glass Knight. We get a much more direct understanding of Velstart's strength when we learn of Raim's story. As once Raim challenged the king's authority and Ashandra's influence, Velstart fought Raim to decisive victory, leading to Raim's exile. We know Raim, even before his descent into the Broom Tower, was too distinctly more powerful than all the other knights of the domain, and Velstart's victory victory over Raim clearly puts him in a place of real authority when it comes to overall strength in the storyline. We can add another layer to this as even before Velstart had come to Drang Lake, he is likely to have already established himself as a mighty warrior in Shulva, as Alana still conjures memories of him during her boss battle, testament to the lasting strength Velstart was able to demonstrate wherever he went. By the time we meet Velstart, he is, true to his nature, lying dutifully at the foot of his now hollow lord. Velstart, despite casting an aura to repel the dark, has manifested much of the dark's qualities into his own. But much like Artorius, this dark has not unsettled much of his fighting ability, only embellished it with a much more unstable core. This fight with Velstart is likely one of the greatest challenges we face in Dark Souls 2. As one of the last obstacles to the throne of want and the chance to commandeer a new age befitting your own narrative, we have two very enigmatic beings who sit awaiting you, the Throne Watcher and Throne Defender. As beings with absolutely no direct clue of their origins, there is one thing we know for certain. As per their item descriptions, we learn that they have been here a very long time. So long, they likely existed before Drang Lake and even Vendrick. We learn that Drang Lake Castle was built upon the remnants of the Kiln of the First Flame, and hence the tombs of the First Flame itself. Vendrick, at the cusp of taking the throne and the ability to start a new age, betrayed his birthright as the chosen undead and fled to a place of eternal hiding. As he knew Nishandra had ultimately influenced the construction of Drang Lake Castle through the golems she commissioned through through Vendrick's ability to steal the ancient artifact or knowledge from the land of the giants. 
She ultimately sought to influence the king into taking the throne and acting as a proxy for her own gain, likely to usher in the age of the dark, an age that translated the goals of her father, Manus. It's likely that both the throne watcher and defender were subjects of the previous chosen undead, now long forgotten. These guardians are likely in the place of this previous chosen undead to ensure that the next monarch is of worthy calibre to link the first flame, much as Gwyn did and much as their previous undead champion had before. We can use all this information to measure the strength level of both beings. Let's get a quick definitive benchmark out the way first though. Prime Vendrick likely could overpower both Guardians with ease as their existence was predetermined as beings who would be overcome by the bearer of the four Lord Souls. And in this case, this was Vendrick. But if we are to truly assess where the two heroes go, it's likely they played a role not too dissimilar to Velstart and Raim. In an alternative universe, I can definitely see both Velstart and Raim assuming their position when Vendrick took the throne. In this, we can assume their combined strength would resemble something of that calibre, as they were likely the Velstart and Raim of a long forgotten chosen undead. When we combine the item description of their soul we learn that their power was appropriate for the kiln of the first flame. In this, the estimation of their strength is likely to be immense, as this was indeed Gwyn's old mantle. Duke Seldora's obsession with acquiring knowledge and power eventually led him to discovering the Brightstone Cove. The cove is likely the remnants of Seath's original crystal cave. During this time, Seldora utilised much of his resources to mine the crystals of this cove and became incredibly wealthy, developing a strong economy and many denizens flocking to his empire for work. Alongside his affinity for wealth, Saldora had also began a fascination with spiders, or more so, a spider named Freya, an originally small and solitary being as indicated by his bedchamber, it's likely Saldora found this spider during his plundering of the Bright Cove. A lord to this feeble thing, the duke would take the spider and give it a home in his own bedchamber and cherish it as his own child, referring to it as his dear Freya. Likely unbeknownst to the duke, the spider in his possession held on to what is described in the game as the writhing ruin, and likely the ineffable soul of Seath the Scaleless. Seldora, as described in the game's item description, is often touted as greedy and ambitious, not unlike Seath, and it's very likely that this greed is what he projected through the spider, allowing it to begin to consume his own citizens and grow large, larger than the Duke had ever imagined, outgrowing her cage, and much like the Lord she harboured the soul of, creating an ecosystem of her own. Spiders would begin to invade the town to such an extent it would overrun the entire region. Seldora, either in guilt, madness or a twisted sense of pride, would watch on as his realm succumbed to the influence of Freya. Freya was able to consume and manifest the souls of the majority of this large town and reproduce what is likely a massive army of spiders under her command. Growing extremely large in size too, Freya would actualize a major portion of Seed's soul and draw an affinity to sorcery too. Freya's power became a reflection of Seed's very own, and unlike many of the other inheritors of the Lord Souls already mentioned, it's likely she was at the time we meet her, the closest reflection of the Lord Soul she inherited. Developing her own hardened skin akin to the crystals of Seath, the ability to use sorcery and a domain completely under her grasp, a domain, remember, that even fended off against Prime Vendrick's own battalions. The Duke's Dear Freya easily sits atop even some of the other Lord inheriting entries.
The old Iron King, originally a budding lord, had visions of power and glory. On his path to realise these, he would utilise these ambitions to overthrow the old rulers of Ven. Commanding victory, he stood tall as its new ruler. With dreams of an even greater kingdom, he would meet Sir Alon. A talented warrior from the distant east, Alon took favour to the Old Iron King and even trained various members of his domain, granting them a unique prowess with katanas and great bows. It's unmentioned why Alon bore an affinity for the Iron King. Was he drawn to his ambition or a certain soul that manifested within this ambition? Regardless, these soldiers trained by Alan would bolster the strength of the ambitious kingdom and eventually the old Iron King would find an iron producing miracle allowing him the ability to manipulate iron. It's important to note too during this time that the old Iron King may have come to the possession of Gwyn's Lord Soul. There is some debate as to when the Lord Soul was found by the old Iron King as there is some indication that the old Iron King only found the Lord Soul upon his final act as he sunk into the lava. However, it's more likely that the old Iron King was either born with the Lord Soul causing his unwavering ambition for greatness or found or manifested it through this very ambition. With the power of Gwyn's Lord Soul and the ability to manipulate iron, he harboured the means to build a kingdom of iron and called on various craftsmen from different regions to help him realise his former ambitions of greatness. And many would heed this call. Notably was Magus Eagle, a man who sought to breathe fire into life. On the back of this, the Iron King was able to build a domain so large that it eclipsed the former kingdom of Ven in notoriety. Eventually, he would even create automatons with the help of Eagle, fulfilling Eagle's longing to create living fire by granting them souls, likely the same way Gwyn did in the original game. With an empire both powerful and large, the old Iron King couldn't be too complacent for long, as just like in Gwyn's old empire, his domain was being threatened by the undead curse, and much like Gwyn, he took drastic measures and incredibly unethical methods in dealing with this curse. Commissioning various groups of undead hunters, jailers and torturers, he led the most prominent campaign against the undead, creating the Executioner's Chariot and the Legion of Men who would eventually become the Skeleton Lords in the Huntsman Cops. With the campaign against the undead underway, the old Iron King began to change, taking on a much more hedonistic form. Upon this realisation, Alon would become distasteful at his old friend's new image and would leave the Iron Kingdom to seek refuge in a place of his own. Bringing a few fellow warriors from the kingdom, his refuge would be short-lived, as the old Iron King, vengeful at the thought of this betrayal, would charge into Alon's keep, executing the treasonous knights and eventually slaying Alon, a testament to the acquired might of the king. The Old Iron King would soon see his own undoing when one notable automaton granted a soul by the Old Iron King began to rebel. Much like the four kings of New Londo did for Gwyn, except this automaton, the Smelter Demon, was much more successful than the four kings and would eventually go on to destroy the entire kingdom and the Old Iron King forcing him deep into the lava of his own undoing. The effortlessness of the smelter demon killing the old Iron King is less of an indictment on the inability for the old Iron King to fend for himself, and more so a praise of how monumentally powerful the smelter demon was, as the old Iron King through his reign demonstrated the greatest strength and influence to his contemporaries, and even shines well above the other inheritors of the Lord Souls such as the Dukes de Freya and the Lost Sinner. 
By the time we meet the old Iron King, he has re-arisen from the lava and much like Gwyn had after he had burned himself to the first flame, was reborn in a new way. Taking on the form of a horned beast, we face off against a malformed version of the king, retaining great size and the soul of Gwyn. It's hard to assume how much of the strength from the law is retained at the point that we meet him, but for the video, I'll assume he is just as strong as he was during his peak, as the Iron King Hammer states that the old Iron King, even when he was thrown into the lava, continued to be a vessel that bred Icarus Earth and the magma within retaining a smouldering core. For these reasons, amongst his three other Lord Inheriting contemporaries, the Old Iron King is likely the most powerful. What more would you expect from a spiritual descendant of Gwyn? Likely the closest descendant to the everlasting dragons we meet in this game, Sin is a mighty dragon of similar calibre to Calamit from the original game, sharing size, design, flight, and even the ability to breathe fire. Upon its residence, many inhabitants would come to revere the Goliath of a beast, and likely wanted to draw an affinity to the beast as a means of sharing its primordial essence in the same way that Drang Lake sought to be close to the remnants of everlasting dragons with the intention it would unlock many of the mysteries of life from the undead curse to the history of the land. Drang Lake's affinity to the dragons would culminate into a sect of men likely commissioned by Vendrick to seek out the blood of dragons, likely as a means for Aldir to further his experimentations. The Drakeblood Knights led by Yorg would face off against Shulver, find the beast and pierce its scales only to find it was harbouring a much deeper secret than the blood of a dragon. Sin was filled with a poisonous pus, so great that the entirety of Shulver would become clouded in this poison disfiguring the city for the rest of time. When assessing the strength of Sin, we have quite a few things to go off of. Firstly, the dragon was able to withstand so much inherent poison likely afflicted to him by Alana, and yet survive, a feat unmatched in the timeline. Secondly, Alana, a being of Manus, required strength to project her will. Nashandra found strength in Vendrick, Elana found strength in Sin. In this, we can assume Elana saw Sin as a being that represented a comparable force to a chosen undead that held all four Lord Souls, or at least a force that could elevate herself in the same way Vendrick could for Nashandra. Third, Sin's power measurements are direct. We know the city of Shulva and even Elana knew the dragon alone bear enough power to destroy the city and all of its inhabitants alone. Rituals were developed by the people of Shulva as a means of keeping the beast asleep to preserve their kingdom as they knew too its threat was monumental. Finally, once awoken and relieved of a large portion of its poison, Sin is able to ravage the city uncontested. Something we actually get to see firsthand. When we do formally face off against Sin, he is pierced, but the piercing is likely to have made the being stronger than its earlier iteration, as we learn from various item descriptions that Yorg's actions may have actually returned the beast to a former level of purity, a form that precedes Elana's poisoning. In this, our battle is one with a beast that holds the power to bring an entire city to its knees. A beast that was formerly poisoned and posed a threat even then, but now has been purified and holds an even greater threat now. Under all of these factors, Sin proves to have the ability to facilitate immense feats of power which are further embellished by its close descendants to the everlasting dragons. In this, Sin easily secures a place this high on the list. B 
Born Rame, the Fume Knight is the story of a man of talent, nobility, humiliation, and rebirth. Originally a swordsman of Vendrick's domain, Rame quickly rose the ranks of Vendrick's guard. We learn from item descriptions that Vendrick famed warriors who displayed strength above all else, and Rame epitomised everything Vendrick valued, reaching his zenith as Vendrick's royal Aegis alongside Velstart. He served Vendrick ferociously and stood by his side for his entire tenure. However, as his dear king began falling closer to the influence of Nashandra at the precipice of an aggressive war against the giants, Raim disavowed his plans and was seen as a traitor. Velstart, furious at Raim's betrayal, fought Raim, and Raim was beaten. Left humiliated, Raim left Dranglake, abandoning his shield-seeking strength. Strength that would allow him to actualise his moral compass. Raim travelled far and would eventually find a land covered in a black smog. A smog that reminded him of the darkness of Nashandra. Venturing into the fog, Raim would find an eerily similar presence in the land. Nadalia, the Bride of Ash. A being born from the same fragments of Manus that Nashandra and her sisters were born from. With the intention of defeating Nadalia and wielding the power to do so as described in the Fume Ultra Greatsword, Raim instead found a parental figure not unlike what he saw in Vendrick. Nadalia consoled Raim, and it was in this consolation that Raim would find an eerie peace, one that caused him to abandon his original mission and chose instead to live alongside Nadalia. The Fume Sword tells us he would live alongside the company of the Child of the Dark, and her essence would imbue itself into his very being, his omniment, and his soul. And we learn from the Baneful Ring that Rain would find immense power from Nadalia, one that formed a stalwart warrior, a being that could finally defeat Velstar. Ironically, Nadalia's influence would untemper his vengeance and he would find a home outside her throne room, forever defending his queen. This is exactly where we meet Raim, much like Velstart, standing tall at the gates of their monarch. However, where Velstart was reluctantly becoming infused by the dark, Raim had embraced it. And it is in this embrace that Raim has adopted incredibly great strength. Through this, we are facing off against the primordial power of both Nadalia and the incredible swordsmanship of Raim epitomised in his new form as the Fume Knight. And it's this combination of power from Nadalia and Raim that make the Fume Knight one of the most powerful beings in Dark Souls 2, and why it ranks so high on this list, so far above even Velstart. The next entry is one of my favourites. I love a case where in Dark Souls a being's true strength is kept mostly hidden, but we are told explicitly that they were able to command such strength that even successors to primordial lords would be brought down by them effortlessly. The Smelter Demon is a mass of iron that had been given life by the Old Iron King. Bearing the soul of Gwyn, the Old Iron King and likely his loyal inventor, Magus Eagle, would utilise the power of fire, the Scorching Iron Scepters, and likely Gwyn's ability to transfer portions of his own soul to create automatons, as described in the Smelter Demon Soul item description. Many automatons were created, but one stood tallest among the others, the Smelter Demon. The Smelter Demon we are speaking of in this entry relates to the main game Smelter Demon, though much, not all of its merits can also be translated to its DLC counterpart. Just like the original recipients of Gwyn's primal soul from the first game, these demons, once sworn to their creators, would harbour independent ambitions of their own, even if it unaligned them from the goals of their creator. 
Much like the four kings of New Londo, we learn the Smelter Demon harboured some antagonism to their master, and unlike the four kings, were actually able to overthrow their master with one single swing, as indicated by the item descriptions of the Smelter Sword. This one swing would bring down the old iron king and drown his kingdom in a pool of molten iron, forever malforming the territory. With such explicit detail on the strength of the smelter demons, it's clear they were crafted to near perfection, masters of their own strength with powers able to disturb pools of lava fit to cover an entire seemingly impenetrable kingdom. The old Iron King too was no pushover, boasting one of the longest reigning kingdoms Drang Lake would ever see, and such influence that the world saw his domain as the main hub for trade. We have to ask ourselves, how immensely powerful must the smelter demon be to undo all of this in a single swipe? When we meet the smelter demon, it's very likely the exact smelter demon that brought down the old Iron King in a single swipe. And as we stand trapped in a circular room with this behemoth, a swift death is likely to be our only concern. With such explicit written detail to the strength of the Smelter Demon, it's likely the strongest boss by pure description alone. The final entries after this edge out on top due to the narrative detail and influence on their overall strength. The next entry is a mighty one. The Giant Lord is two things, the King of the Giants and also in the present day, the last giant found under the forest of the fallen giants. There are striking parallels between Vendrick and the Giant Lord, both aesthetically but also thematically. In the present day, we meet the Giant Lord in the form of the Last Giant, likely at the end of his life with a soul at the brink of dwindling. It's likely the Last Giant is little more than a sentient bark filled with vengeance at this point. And on the other side, we meet Vendrick, a being who is completely soulless and hollowed, aimlessly wandering around his crypt with little in the way of force. But the thematic tones of both the Giant Lord and Vendrick were likely present even during their heydays. Although we know little about the Giant Lord's rise to royalty, it's likely he was on a parallel trajectory to Vendrick himself, awarded commanding authority over the entirety of the Land of Giants in the same way Vendrick did over the Land of Humans in Drang Lake. Vendrick, influenced by Nishandra, would pursue the Land of Giants and wage a prolonged conflict, eventually coming out on top and stealing a special something. This allowed him the ability to create golems. In this, Vendrick had created a collision course with the King of the Giants, and in some time, the Giant Lord would invade Drang Lake and cause irreparable damage to the kingdom and just fall short condemned to be a prisoner in the rubble. In many instances, the strength of the Giant Lord is likely the closest parallel we have to the power of Prime Vendrick. Everything in the lore from Captain Drummond's dialogue to item descriptions of his soul and the Giant's kinship indicate the Giant Lord maintained the same level of force as Vendrick himself. Bearing thematic parallels and an almost identical stature and armaments to match, in many senses, the closest thing we get to facing Prime Vendrick is by travelling through the memories back to the past to face off against one of his greatest rivals in the Giant Lord. The Giants alone are one of the most formidable forces in the game, and even their soul alone was able to be used to revive an old, everlasting dragon. When we consider the Giant Lord was not only just a regular giant, but one who held the greatest, most influential position in their bloodline, one that was so monumental that slaying the beast granted the key to controlling golems made in their image, we can only assume his strength to either just fall short of Vendrick himself or on a parallel level to Vendrick. It's likely the only reason the giant was brought down was due to an intervention by a certain chosen undead, and without such intervention, the giant would likely have made it to Vendrick himself, converging for what is likely to be one of the greatest battles in the history of the Souls games. 
It's no doubt that Nishandra saw the threat of the giants long before any such conflict was realised, and it's likely she knew the only way of overcoming the giants was through an undeclared preemptive strike at a time the giants were least expecting it. The giant lord secures itself a position I would usually reserve for Prime Vendrick, as we never truly do get to meet Prime Vendrick in such a manner as a boss battle. Unlike the Iron King, the Ivory King did not build a kingdom on the ambitions of materialising a home for his ego. Instead, he erected a kingdom selflessly, tasking himself with keeping at bay one of the greatest forces in the entire Dark Souls timeline. Born in Ferosa, the Ivory King found himself at the height of greatness, formalising his position as the highest ranking knight. This alone is a feat rarely matched in the entire game as Ferosa hosted some of the most notable heroes in the game. Heroes that would become famed for their ability to fight, heroes who found lifelong success as cell swords. The Ivory King, however, did not take on this profession, for he was bound by a moral compass that saw him at the front line of war whenever his country was under threat. It was under this treatise that the Ivory King would erect Elaeum Lois. Built on top of the lasting remnants of the Bed of Chaos, the Ivory King knew only he was of the aptitude to keep this existential threat at bay. Bound by his ambition to protect, he created a kingdom at the heart of this terror. Housing his throne at the entrance of the Twisted Flame of Chaos, he vowed to be the first and final welcome to the horrors that would emerge. Bringing his faithful knights, he organised a council of talented warriors hailing from Ferosa to watch over the flames and did so with such efficiency that the threats of which we never see at any point of the game. However, all kings are due a queen, and much like those before him, a queen would come, and just like the other kings, this queen was born from Manus, the father of the Abyss. The Burnt Ivory King, however, knew this, and fiercely loyal to protecting those who could not defend themselves, sheltered the Queen and bare the weight of both the Flames of Chaos and the Abyss all at once. The Ivory King's soul was immense, but as we have learned, souls that burn the brightest cast the bigger shadow, and either at the realisation of his hollowing or the power of his dwindling soul, he cast himself into the flames of chaos to forever be bound by it, and use his will as a direct force to keep it at bay. Alsana, his wife, unlike her sisters, although intended to use the king as a proxy for their own homecoming at first, instead revered her lord. His resolve unmatched, his will unwavering, she cast off the sum of her own parts and in the wake of her king's absence took charge of Elaeum Lois, not as the Queen of Dark, but as an extension of her king's legacy, locking the gates of Elaeum Lois in an avalanche of ice, forever keeping in the threats that would one day come to be. As the Ivory King fought the powers of the Flames of Chaos, he was followed head first by his loyal knights, who were too in reverence of their king's will and happily gave their own to be by his side. When we meet the Ivory King, it's the only fight ever that we are asked to recruit the help of his knights that stayed behind as we face off against him and his own company. There is a reason why even gameplay-wise such a feat is necessary, as the law points out five key features as to why defeating the Ivory King is the game's greatest achievement. Firstly, he was the only king able to tame the darkness in his queen, a testament to the strength of his soul. 
Secondly, he was likely the most powerful knight of Ferosa, a land that likely harboured the greatest in the entire trilogy. Third, he single-handedly kept the flames of chaos at bay. Ask yourself why we never see any demons born from the chaos flame in this game when we consider the sheer extent to how powerful the Bed of Chaos is in the first game, a force that Gwyn was unable to isolate even during his prime, this achievement takes on a new meaning. As the fourth point, he is so powerful we canonically are asked to fight him with company, the only time in the game that we are ever told to do so. Even in the burnt state we meet him, his power seems to have not dwindled at all, still harbouring the extent of his icy abilities. In this, he was able to withstand the mutating force of the bed of chaos for as long as he did while still hosting his own form. All in all, positioning the Ivory King as the greatest force we face head on in the game. Testament to one man's talent, resolve, ambition, and a legacy that still united a kingdom many ages after his final act. The actions of the Ivory King remain unmatched in this entire installation of the series, and his achievements, though subtle, overshadow any of which we see from any other being in its history, including that of Vendrix, the chosen undead to conquer the Four Lord Souls. Bringing us to the end of the video. Thank you guys for making it all the way through. Dark Souls 2 has more bosses than any other installation of the Souls franchise and getting in the research of every boss lore and ranking were quite an undertaking. I appreciate a lot of you will have differing opinions and I'd love to hear what you thought. Where did you place each boss? Please let me know in the comment section. I'm currently working on the Dark Souls 3 version of this video, so if you'd like to see more of this sort of content, please feel free to like and subscribe to keep up to date with all of my content.